work. And, uh, and one of the things that, that these lessons have brought to fruition for us is a study of, of the various issues that pertain uh, to the ideas, the doctrines of non-institutionalism uh, in the Lord's Church, that uh, this matter divided the church um, probably starting about 70 years ago, uh, 60 to 70 years ago. Uh, in most places, uh, in most places, um, this is not uh, an issue uh, for the church, uh, primarily because uh, our non-institutional brethren, as, as all of us have done, for the most part, have gone down and down and down and down, but them more so uh, than what we call the mainstream uh, congregations and so but the area in which we live is still quite, uh, is still quite, I hate to use the word bothered, but um, it's still quite prevalent in our area. And, uh, and it's worthy of our dis uh, uh, study and discussion. And, uh, and in fact, if you look at uh, um, uh, Mike uh, Lynn, I think it was, uh, uh, published a, a book or publishes a book on... Uh, the churches, it's got all the addresses and whatnot. And if uh, if you look at if you look at the churches of Christ that have a Russellville address, uh, I think 17 out of 19 of those congregations have a non-institutional designation. 17 out of 19, and that is uh, fairly consistent all the way across the state uh, uh, to Athens, which I refer to as the mecca of the non-institutional movement. It's kind of the the, the the holy city, uh, if, if I might coin a term, of the non-institutional movement, Athens, Alabama, and so we're still we're still troubled by it in, in a lot of in a lot of corners, and it certainly needs uh, to be discussed. And, and we've had some very good response from our studies on uh, Sunday morning and on Sunday night. In fact, uh, two Sunday nights ago, when we introduced the matter, uh, we've had almost a thousand views, almost a thousand views on the Facebook live stream. And so, and in fact, uh, I talked to a, a, a very nice brother from Alaska who called me on my way to St. Louis last week, and we talked for nearly an hour, and uh, he holds the non-institutional view. Uh, we had a very good conversation, and, and I anticipate that we'll have more uh, in the future, but uh, this has generated a lot of interest, but it's something that we need, it's something that we need to study and that we need to be prepared to talk about. Uh, in our area, if you're not aware, uh, the church at the, what's the West Hamilton Church, um, which is headed out toward uh, Weston, it's up, can't hardly see the building, it's up on the hill on the right, is a non-institutional church. Uh, the Northside Church at Brilliant is a non-institutional church. Um, the Bethel Church on 233 going south is a non-institutional uh, church. At one time, Pleasant Ridge was a non-institutional church. Um, and so there are still there are still a number of uh, of non-institutional brethren. Um, the um, Needmore is a non-institutional church out near just past the hospital uh, in Haleville. So there are still several uh, there are still several non-institutional brethren in our immediate area, and uh, and so uh, it's something that we need to be aware of, and something that uh, is certainly worthy of our consideration. Now, one of the things that that you'll find. Um, and, and, and I think this is absolutely the truth, is that, that our brethren that hold these views hold them out of respect for the Scriptures. All right? And I think that's an important thing for us to remember because the, the brethren that have left us on the liberal side have done so because they have no regard for the authority or very little regard for the authority of the scriptures, you know, the brethren that among us that have introduced uh, women in leadership roles, that have introduced instrumental music. Uh, one uh, congregation in Memphis, uh, their eldership uh, determined that uh, drinking alcohol socially was no longer an issue uh, for them, and even have uh, church functions uh, where alcohol uh, is served. You have uh, brethren that are using what we call praise teams. Uh, with men and women standing in front, or uh, and in other places, you'll have uh, people that in the audience that'll have microphones 
You know, even though they can't be visible up front, they'll put microphones on them to enhance their voices over the voices of the rest of the, of, of, of the, of the, the church. Uh, there are brethren that don't believe in the necessity of baptism anymore. I mean, there's just a host of things where people have left the authority of the scriptures uh, and, and headed off in the wrong direction. Uh, but again, it's because they've abandoned respect for the Bible. And again, country-wise, our non-institutional brethren, I think, hold the Bible in very high regard. Uh, they want to hold up to the authority. They want to hold to the authority of the Scripture, and so uh, you know. With that in mind, I, to me, it, it seems easier to, to talk with and study with those brethren. Uh, I think they're. I think they're mistaken. Um, uh, I think that they have. I think they have a misguided view of authority. And this particular lesson deals with that matter expressly from the outset. And the reason I've got this up here is because. In, in realms of Bible study or even in, 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 in philosophical realms in general, uh, in the area of logic, uh, there is, uh, there is a, a method of determining truth or that can be used to determine truth, which is called a syllogism. A syllogism is a, is a logical statement, and it starts with a major premise and it has a minor premise. does it right very well. But a syllogism starts with a major premise and a minor premise from which a conclusion is drawn. All right? And so, uh, and so Scrooge begins uh, in the opening lines here, 165. He says, there are sincere, honest, conscientious people who have accepted the Bible teaching that God's people should care for the needy but have erroneously come to the conclusion that the most substantial arrangements that have been made for doing so are unscriptural, primarily talking about orphans' homes, homes for the aged. Uh, some hold that the homes themselves are unscriptural, while others pronounce them unscriptural because of the methods employed in supporting and operating them. Uh, and says, those who hold that homes are wrong in themselves have come to this conclusion, erroneous conclusion, from the following reasoning. And so you see, here's the, the, the syllogism that's presented. It says, the major premise is that it is unscriptural to use any method, means, or arrangement in caring for the unfortunate today that was not used by Christians in the first century. You might also, uh, it could also be reworded, it, or, there is no authority to use any method, means, or arrangement in caring for the unfortunate that was not used by the Christians in the first century. So to say a thing is unscriptural or to say that there's no authority for it uh, would be the same thing. And I think that most of the brethren on the non-institutional side would phrase it the second way, that there's no authority in the Bible to do these things. And then the minor premise is Christians of the first century did not use homes to care for the unfortunate. Therefore, the conclusion is it is unscriptural for Christians to use or support homes to care for the unfortunate today. And so the lesson will begin by examining the major and minor premises. All right, now, let me give you an example of how a syllogism, how a syllogism works. And I ran off and I, I, had a, I had a sheet full of syllogisms, but maybe I can remember. All right. Uh, a major syllogism, uh, syllogism, a major, uh, would say all, all birds lay eggs. All right? Minor premise. A chicken is a bird. So the conclusion is what? Chickens lay eggs. So... This premise, the major premise, is true. Then the minor premise, which is couched inside the major premise, is also true. Therefore, the conclusion is true. All right? So you see, you see how this works. Now, these things can be tricky because they can appear to be valid when, in fact, they are not valid. All birds lay eggs.
chickens lay eggs. Therefore, chickens are birds. Now, is this right? Is this syllogism? Is this syllogism right? Uh-huh. They are birds and they do lay eggs. But does but does the syllogism prove it? It does not. Right? But by the way, all these statements are correct, but the syllogism is incorrect. Now, if you're scratching your head and wondering why the syllogism is incorrect. Snakes lay eggs. Therefore, snakes are birds. What about turtles? Well, it doesn't matter. It could be anything. But you see, the, syllogi the syllogism using chickens, even though every statement was, was correct, the syllogism didn't prove the conclusion because I substituted snakes for chickens. And, there, and, and then, obviously, the conclusion ends up being wrong. You see how that works? And so well, I, I want you to kind of understand how some of these things work because if a, if a uh, if any part of the syllogi any part of the syllogism any part of the syllogism can be uh, can be false or faulty. And so if you end up with a faulty major premise you can end up you're going to end up with a faulty conclusion. If you have a minor premise that is faulty, all right, or you can build assumptions, you can build assumptions into, you can build assumptions into this. Uh, uh, everyone who runs a marathon sweats a lot. Is that true? Well, I've run 13 of them. And I ain't never seen nobody come across dry. If they don't, there's something wrong. Yeah, if you don't sweat <laughs> running 26 miles, there's something bad wrong, all right? Everyone who runs a marathon sweats a lot. Greg is sweating a lot. Therefore, Greg has just run a marathon. See that? Or I was going to use this if Philip was going to be here. You know, people that are lying act nervous. Philip is acting nervous. <coughs> Therefore, Philip is lying. Not you, Philip. Philip can't. Wrong Philip. Because I'm this Philip can lie and not be nervous. <laughs> I know because before we had caller ID, she called me and tried to prank me. Not a, nervous, not a nervous tinge in his voice anywhere. Right. But you see, you see how you can you can draw you can draw what appears to be logical conclusions, but the the premise, you know, the premise, either the major or the minor, is wrong. Now, going back to the lesson, it is unscriptural. I, I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna write it the way that, that I said it the second time. You know, there is no authority, and I'm going to do this, operate in any way not found in the New Testament. <coughs> church, I'm going to put the New Testament church did not use or uh, uh, what's the word? Operate or purport. Yeah. Use or operate uh, orphans' homes. Therefore, it is without authority to operate an orphan's home. That's basically the
premise that's on page 165. You're going to go jump over some book? Well, maybe. <laughs> now, Bob, Bob, at Bob page 165 says, is the major premise true? Is it without, is it unscriptural or unbiblical to use any method that the New Testament church never used? And I will say no. I will say no. And for example, you know, there are a number of things, there are a number of things that we do uh, today to carry out other commands that are given to us that the New Testament church never utilized. All right? Just by way of example, the building we're sitting in right now, there is no example anywhere in the New Testament of a congregation owning, building its own church building. There's not an example of it anywhere. And yet, all of our non-institutional friends, or most of them at least, would affirm that a church can own its own building. Why? Well, because the church is commanded to meet, and therefore we're at liberty to use our common sense to carry out that command to meet in whatever way is the most expedient for the church to do that, right? So the command to meet is given, but how to carry that command out is not specified, correct? In the, in the same way, is the church commanded to care for widows and orphans? It is. It is. Now, we'll talk about this some more on Sunday night, or tonight. Well, maybe not tonight, but at some point in our series, that, uh, that they'll argue that the church is not commanded to care for widows and orphans, but individual Christians are. In other words, they draw a false distinction between the work of the Christian and the work of the church. But we are commanded to care for widows and orphans, right? Now, do we not have the same liberty to exercise to exercise expediency in how we care for widows and orphans? That, right? We're commanded to preach the gospel, right? Now, is that an individual or, or collective responsibility? Yes. Right. yes. <laughs> it is an individual or, and a collective responsibility. Do we, do we use methods today in preaching the gospel that the New Testament church never used? Sure. You've got TV, radio, all kinds of Television, radio, internet, Bible correspondence courses. I mean, there, there are any number of things that, that we all understand that the church can use to carry out the general command to preach the gospel. By the way, did anybody in the first century ever get on an airplane and go, and, and, and go into all the world on an airplane or a car or a train? And yet, no one would argue, no one would argue that those things are unscriptural to use because they're expedient in carrying out the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so, so the major, in the, in the, the major premise here is faulty because, as the Scripture says in uh, in the bottom of page one sixty five, he says, "What evidence is there to support this?" In other words, what is it, where is it in the scriptures that says you can't do anything that the first century church never did? And it, it, it's not there. It's not there. Uh, over on page 166. Uh, actually, at the, at, the, at the bottom of 165, over 166. It is true that Christians were admonished to be examples and to follow examples. But such instructions always have reference to what to do and never applied to the detailed manner in which it was to be done. When God told Noah to build an ark, there were some specifics within that, right? 
Then there was a lot that was left up to Noah to, to get it done. Right? In the same way, you know, we're, commanded, we're commanded to care for widows and orphans and even those that are not Christians. Galatians 6 and verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially those of the household of the faith. In Matthew chapter 5 and verses uh, 13 through 16, You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for thenceforth good for nothing that we cast out and trampled underfoot by men. Then verse 14, 15, 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a candlestick, so that it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, does it not seem reasonable that the men in that verse are non Christians? Let your light therefore so shine before men that they, those men, may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven? Now, would that not at least I'm not going to say it necessarily implies it, but it, does it not at least insinuate that your good works are to be done to those that are outside the household of faith? How can I let my light shine before men and, and, re, and refuse to help them in, in, in time of need? And if I can do it, and this goes all the way back to two weeks ago, if I can do it, and Dwayne and I can do it, and Dwayne and I and Dwayne and Wade and I can do it. And Dwayne and Wade and Kevin and Furman and Jeremiah and I can do it. Then we can all do it, right? Now, and if we all do it, what's the difference in, in that and saying that the church did it? Does that make sense? In other words, if we do it collectively or we do it individually, it makes no difference. It makes no difference whatsoever. Does that make sense? And so the, the idea that, that well, I'll just give you an example of, of where, I'll, I'll give you an example as to where this type of thinking will go. If, 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 a, if an unnatural and unreasonable distinction is made between the work of the Christian and the work of the church collectively, this is, this is, this is where you would end up. That every member of the church could contribute outside of the normal contribution and send money to a non-Christian. All of us could. But if it ever ends up right here, you can't. That's, that's where the... That's, by the way, those of you that watch on TV can't see this is what I'm talking about. All right? You put a box at the back door and every single Christian in this church can put money in it and send it to, to help a non-Christian. But if it goes right here, this is the magic plate. And the magic plate means you can't do anything with this for a non-Christian. That's where, that's where that kind of... I think Brother Guy Wood said it like this. He said, he said, those brethren are more concerned about whether... The plate passes by the Christian or the Christian passes by the plate. In other words, if the plate passes by the Christian, that's one thing. But if the Christian passes by the plate at the back door, that's a whole different matter altogether. That's where, that's where this kind of thinking, that's what it leads to. And so as we think about, as we think about this major premise, we find that it's false. Therefore, the minor premise is not even relevant because the major premise is false and therefore the conclusion, the conclusion itself uh, is false. All right, looking at the, look down at the bottom of page 166. I find this is so insightful, so insightful. All right, uh, 
about oh, eight or nine lines from the bottom. Eight or nine lines from the bottom. Where it begins, it is grossly unreasonable. All right, listen to this. It is grossly unreasonable to assume that the work of the church today in this 20th century civilization with its vast changes in human relationship and economic conditions that have given rise to the problems or to problems of human welfare that were unknown to people of the first century can be achieved successfully by the procedures that were practicable in the solutions of the problems of that day. Or, speaking from the other side of the picture, it is unthinkable and preposterous that the people of the first century should have been given detailed instructions on how to deal with problems that they had no acquaintance with or no experience. In other words, the changes, the, in other words, there are so many things. Well, let, me put, let me put it this way. The reason that the Bible is not continually being updated in other words, I mean the real Bible, the, the, the authoritative body of scriptures themselves. Because of all the changes. In other words, uh, yeah. there, are thing, there are things that we are tempted with today that the first century was not tempted with. Okay? Right? I mean, there, in other words, just the, the society has changed. Yeah. So, so the Bible was given to the people of the first century in a general enough way for them to deal with the problems that they had. But also given to us today with that same view of generality that allows us to deal with our problems that we have today. For example, what a, you know, can you imagine what would the first century church have said or thought about if the word internet was in the Bible? If God had given instructions on, on how to use or not to use the internet, I mean, it would, I mean for 2,000 years it wouldn't have meant anything to anybody, right? But are there, gener are, there general, uh, are there general statements made in the scriptures that would have covered the problems of the first century that also covered the problems of the 21st century? Without having to be specific about every specific problem. And this is what this is what I talked about a couple of weeks ago with regard uh, with regard to how uh, churches support missionaries. And I said this, and, and it's true. There is no example of a sponsoring congregation in the first century. If you don't know what I mean by that, that the Burson Church every month sends money to the Forest Park Church, which, by the way, Kevin's mother-in-law and father-in-law are members at Forest Park that oversees Robert Martin's work. All right, so we have another connection there. All right, every month, the Burleson Church sends however much money every month through the Forest Park Church for Robert. And all the money that goes to support Robert goes through the Forest Park Church. They're his overseeing eldership. He answers to, you know, ultimately, he answers to those men who have oversight over his work. All right? It is expedient for us to do that. Right? And it's also expedient for Robert to do that. Because if you look, I don't have it in front of me, but if you look on the, on the, <coughs> if you look on the bulletin board back there, you'll find that Robert has about 75 or 100 sponsors. Not to mention the people that sponsor his work on an as-I-can basis. You know, for example, somebody might come into some money and, and they appreciate Robert and his work, and they send him a one-time gift. You know, there's all kinds of one-time gifts. So is it easier for all that money to go through the Forest Park Church, or would it be better for Robert and Mary to deal with 100 or 150 checks in the South Pacific? Every single month. So the sponsoring church concept is an expedient. Now, again, you'll never find one in the first century. Why? Because it was an expedient. In other words, the, the means of communication, the means of getting mail from one place to another, or, 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 or whatever it might be, or money from one place 
to another. It wasn't expedient for the first, the early church to, to help missionaries that way. But it is expedient for us to do it. It's, it's by far the easiest way for us to do it. And it doesn't violate any principle of Scripture. There's not one, there's not one syllable in the New Testament that in any way says that you can't have a sponsoring church, either by example or by inference. And so this, this idea, this idea that we everything has to be done exactly the way it was in the first century is a is a faulty major premise that the Bible speaks generally enough so that the people of the first century can do their work and the people of the 21st century can do their work and if the world stands another 2,000 years the people of the 41st century can do their work I mean think about it if this world lasts another 2,000 years it's unimaginable to us right what, what, what this world will be like even if you went back a hundred or two hundred years, nobody in the world could imagine what the world is like now. I mean, microwave oven. You know, just to, just to mention something that seems to be simple, a microwave oven. You know, you know or you go back go back to the 1800s. You know, a jet airplane. You know, a plane that can fly around the world in 24 hours. You know, like the, those uh, the planes that what were they? Um, Concorde. Yeah. The Concorde. Now, in the 41st century, will the Bible still be sufficient? Yes. Will the Bible still be sufficient to deal with the church in the 41st century? And, and I'm glad, I'm glad that God didn't have to put things in the Bible to address the church in the 41st century. That wouldn't have meant anything to the 1st century church and wouldn't have meant anything to the 21st century church. The Bible gives us what we need to get the things done that God wants us to get done. And there's not a syllable anywhere that says how to take care of orphans. There's not a syllable anywhere on how to take care of the needy. Whether they be with us, or whether they be needy saints, or whether they be needy non-saints. But here's the command we do have. You've got to help them. We're commanded to help. And then God left it up to us to use the most expedient way to get these things, to get these things accomplished. All right? And uh, so, and then by, on 167, um, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go here, but Street Media says, you can't prove that the early church didn't have an orphan's home. You can't prove it. You, you can't prove that orphans didn't, didn't, that they didn't congregate orphans in a, in a particular place. Just because the Bible's silent on it doesn't mean that they, that they didn't have such. Like I said, I wouldn't go there, but the, his point's still valid. Just because the Bible's silent on a thing doesn't, doesn't mean that they didn't do it, and it doesn't mean it's forbidden. Did they consider getting lepers and all that? And the, rest of the lepers? Yeah, yeah. You know, how, how, would you, you know, how would you deal with brethren who are lepers? Now, obviously, they... Now, the New Testament didn't demand quarantine the way the Old Testament did, but common sense demands it. Common sense demands that, that they you know, be separated. And so how do you take care of those guys? Well, it's up, it's up to the individual, up to the, up, up, up to the church to handle those matters. All right, uh, I need somebody. Kyle, can you help me? I'm going to get these books handed out while I'm thinking about it.